we're so glad, as I said, to have you worshiping with us today. Uh, it was funny, a moment ago, I just was praying for the offering, and you know, and I could hear some people talking loudly in the lobby, and I'm like, it's strange that they're talking. Someone's talking. I could hear them talking. You know what happened? I read you a verse, and I put my phone in my pocket, and my Bible app started reading to me. And so I was, I was hearing somebody talking, and I'm like, it's so it's coming out of my pocket. So you never know what's going to happen at church today. So please silence your cell phones and buckle up for a great time today. Well, if you are worshiping with us online, I just pray wherever you are joining us from uh, that the sun is shining upon you and that God's grace would be upon you today. So glad to have you with us. And uh, I want to ask you this question. What is the big picture you have for your life this year? What's the big picture? What are the dreams and the goals that you want to see accomplished in your life? You're like, oh, Pastor Jared, this is the 915 service. It's too early for these deep questions, right? Uh, what is the vision that you have for your walk with God? Do you have a vision for your life? Or are you just kind of going day to day? What about the vision for seeing Jesus become part of your friends' lives, right? These are all great questions, and I know it's early, and uh, maybe you haven't even had like a full cup of coffee yet, but uh, we're so, we, we want to look at these questions. See, big picture dreams can often feel like really big leaps from where you are now, don't they? Sometimes we get these pictures in our minds of where we want to be, and when we look at where we are, that can seem like a huge chasm. Whether it's practical goals, whether it's spiritual aspirations, the gap between where you are and where you want to be can sometimes feel as far away as the moon. You saw the, the eclipse that happened uh, last week. Anyone follow that? And we didn't really get to see much of it here, but we saw all the pictures uh, of, the, of the eclipse. But, but the moon is as far away. How do you get from here to the moon? That was actually the question that President JFK asked NASA in the 1960s. And he gave them the goal of landing a man on the moon and then returning him safely to earth. I'm glad that he, you know, had two parts to that mission, right? Can you imagine being the person that got to the moon and never made it back, right? Uh, you'd be a really skinny person right now if you were up there. I just, I don't know. But it took a lot of years for NASA to work out the wrinkles to make that happen, didn't it? Right? In January 1967, Apollo 1 was launched and had a tragic failure with the death of three astronauts as a, uh, the launch pad uh, burst into flames. Apollo missions 7 and 8, they were just missions of orbiting the earth, testing out the modules. Uh, uh, missions 8 and 10, they were uh, circling, uh, orbiting the moon, but they were just testing out the electrical systems. Before they ever sent a man to the moon, we had 11 missions. How many remember July 1969? A few of you, right? Everyone remember the lunar mission, Apollo 11, and it took 11 missions to get to the moon, but every mission was a step closer to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning them back to earth. So how do you get to the moon? How do you get from where you are to where you wanna be? How do you get to the moon? Well, I think uh, you've probably heard this famous uh, saying, but Lance Armstrong, well, not Lance Armstrong, <laughs> Neil Armstrong, <laughs> will tell us, Lance's answer was steroids, I'm just saying, but. But Neil's answer, would you show that clip? Let Neil tell us how to get to the moon. Uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. And now step off the lamina. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Every giant leap forward is really the result of many small steps, isn't it? How do you get from where you are to where you want to be? It's a result of many steps. It takes steps to move forward, right? We learn that, but that before we even walk, we learn how to step. I know some of you came out of the crib running. I know that, and you're still running today. But for most of us, you had to learn to step before you could walk. You remember your parents, you know, walking you around, that back-breaking pose, right? Learning how, you only do that with the first one, I'm just saying, right? 
Like, yeah, look how cute. They're learning. The next ones, you're like, you see them getting up and you knock them over. Like, not yet, right? I mean, we're not ready for that, for your mobility, right? Come on, it's not just me, is it? All right. Have you ever had times when you saw other Christians and you were inspired by their lives? Maybe you looked at someone and you were inspired by their faith or their courage, or their trust in Jesus. Maybe you found yourself so inspired that you wanted that for yourself, but it seemed like such a giant leap from where you were, right? Uh, maybe there's been times when you felt that you were ready to take that jump in your pursuit of Jesus. Students, if you're here today, I, I know that when we come back from camp, and we come back from retreats, and we are all fired up to take on the world, but how we know sometimes it feels like a few weeks later the world's taking you on, and you lost that momentum to take that jump. You know, if we're really honest, most of us have had experience, we've experienced times when we felt guilty because we weren't where we wanted to be spiritually. We weren't where we thought we should be in our Christian walk. And there's a gap between where we are and where we want to be. But every giant leap forward is really the result of many small steps. You know, last week we started this new sermon series called Greater, and I said it, it remains to be seen whether this is greater than all the other sermon series that we've preached before. But we've been journeying through what many believers believe to be one of the best books of the Bible, one of their favorite books. This book is the book of Hebrews, and it's so rich in theology. I was, I've been studying through it, but it's like, I, I don't even know. You know, you highlight the things that stand out to you. But as I read through Hebrews, it's like every single verse is highlighted in multiple colors. It's like a rainbow of color in the book of Hebrews, and it doesn't even stand out anymore. It's all highlighted, you know, as we get into this text. So much depth here. If you want to follow along, it's 13 chapters, and you could be reading a chapter a week and following along. With us, But as we turn to the book of Hebrews, we're going to see throughout the 13 chapters that there's a theme that reoccurs. And that theme is a the theme of greater. And specifically that Jesus is greater. Let me hear you say that this morning. Would you say Jesus is greater? Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And here's the premise for this series. That any time you place something greater than Jesus Christ, you live a lesser life. See, when Jesus Christ isn't in his proper place, then your life is going to be out of order. We see the effects of this uh, disorder around us every day. We see in our world it's the brokenness and the hurt. We see the chaos and the confusion, the distrust and the despair. And so Hebrews is going to point us back to the greatest gift of hope, to the greatest source of healing, to the greatest of all time gift of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest hope of the world. But every giant leap forward is really the result of many small steps. And so the goal of Hebrews is to encourage us to keep stepping towards Jesus. Uh, Pastor Mark Batterson, he, he writes this. He says, the blessing of God is not good luck. It's hard work. The blessing of God is not a magic trick. It's long obedience in the same direction. Sometimes we think the blessing of God is something that we just inherit, something that we're just going to sit here and pray that the blessing of God would wash over us. But as we see through Scripture, the blessing of God comes from the long obedience to the principles of God, to the commands of God. The more we follow faithfully to God, the, the more we are positioned to be blessed by Him. You know what's not hard work, though? What doesn't take any intention on our part? Drifting. Drifting. You ever notice that drifting doesn't take any effort? Right? All you got to do is do nothing. Just go with the flow. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Hebrews chapter 2. Chapter 2 verse 1 says this. And if we read through Hebrews, there's actually five admonitions, five warnings that come through the book. And here's the first one here. Verse 1 so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think that we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit 
whenever he chose. See, this message of salvation Hebrews is talking about was first given to the people of the Old Testament through God's messengers, the angels and the prophets. But he's saying now we have it from the voice of God himself. The Son has come and delivered this message, this gospel good news. And he's saying, how can we turn away from this news? It, it says here that God confirmed Jesus' message, that Jesus was who he claimed to be, that Jesus did what he claimed to do. He was confirmed through the very wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. We continue to see those in operation today. We talked about that just a few weeks ago. But here the author of Hebrew, he, he's delivering this first of the five warnings. That he says, so we must listen carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift from it. I, I've shared this with you before, but my history teacher, knowing what it was like to be a high school student, he always told us, he always said, listen, to, uh, hear me now, and listen to me later. Right? There's a difference between hearing and listening. Right? How many know that when we turn 20, 21, we are starting to listen to all the things that we heard our parents saying all those years before? Right? So he's saying, listen carefully to the truth you heard, or you may drift from it. Put some intention into it. Just for a preview, the other warnings are that if we start drifting, it starts to escalate. The other admonitions are about doubting, about being dull in our spirits, about despising the word of God, and eventually defying the things of God. That's the progression we see through Hebrews. But we have this warning not to drift. A couple uh, years ago, right before our family moved to the beautiful Okanagan, we lived on another lake. We lived on Lake Ontario. And if you've never seen Lake Ontario, Lake Ontario is 54 times the size of Lake Okanagan. It's massive. You can't see the horizon. You can't see the other shore. And we were on this lake, and this lake, you know, it was a great lake for the most part. It actually is the Great Lakes, but uh, it's a great lake. You know, a little pollution in the Hamilton Harbor. I don't know if you want to swim in there. You know, three-eyed fish and some of that, you know, industrial stuff happening. Uh, but... Uh, but this is a big lake, and on this lake, there can be big storms, there can be big waves, so depending on the day, you might go boating, you might go jet skiing, uh, or some people go surfing. You can actually surf on it when the weather's right. Uh, so it's a big lake, and, and so you can imagine my surprise one Saturday morning when I woke up and I saw that this was the headline in the local newspaper. Police rescue family on pink flamingo pool float in Lake Ontario. Now, it seems that this family of three adults on a Friday night thought that it would be a good idea to launch the Flamingo into the Hamilton Harbor and kind of float around and have a few bubbly pops and, uh, and just enjoy life leisurely on the harbor. But what they didn't account for was the drift. Well, it says here what happened to them. The police say the trio spent four hours floating in the water before dropping temperatures and a few large ships passing by, cargo ships, <laughs> led them to call 911 around 2 a.m. and ask for help. Officers found them four kilometers from land and brought them safely back to shore. Can you imagine four kilometers from shore? I don't know what took them so long. I don't know what their plan was. Like, hey, let's just wait four hours and see where we end up. Moving forward requires you to be intentional, but drifting doesn't require anything. So the Hebrew says we must listen carefully to the truth you've heard about Jesus or we may drift away from it. You know, as we saw last week in our series set up, the author of Hebrews is writing to some new believers and he's writing to a group of people who are struggling, struggling for different reasons, with their faith. Some of them, like some of us, have maybe found that there's something significant about Jesus. I, I believe that there's something about Jesus, but I just find myself struggling to commit all the way. Some, like many of us, find themselves pulled in many directions, being so easily distracted. You know, if we're completely honest today, it can be hard to be committed to an invisible God, for being honest, right? It can be hard when we don't fully see all that God promised that we would see. Listen to verse 5. Furthermore, it's not angels who will control the future world we're talking about. For in one place the scriptures say, What are mere mortals that you should think about them, or a son of man that you should care for him? Yet for a little while you, were, uh, made, them, you made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. 
and you gave them authority over all things. So Hebrew, the author is quoting Psalm 8 directly here. Now this is a pretty amazing statement. You know, this is something that you should have highlighted in your Bible, that God made the world for humanity. And that all of creation was meant to be under the care and control. Creation was made for us. It was made for us. But then the preacher, he gives an understatement of the year in verse 8. It says, now when it says all things, it means that nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. We know that we are supposed to be given creation and dominion over this world. But how many know that we can't even be in control of the world? We, we find it hard to be in control of our own world, right? We have a hard time managing our schedules. We have a hard time tending our relationship and, and controlling our own impulses, let alone governing the world and creation. But here we see this understatement. We, we've been given authority. God's given it to us, but we have not yet seen all things placed in the place that God promised. You know, what's wrong with our world? What is this world coming to? Those are the questions that we are surrounded by every day. You know, it's not hard to look around us and see that not everything is the way it should be or the way that we think that it should be. This is actually one of the greatest problems that people have with Christianity. This is one of the arguments people have against God. It, it, the, the problem is the problem of evil and the problem of suffering. Right? If we have these tsunamis and these wildfires and these droughts and these family, but we look around us, we see war and abuse and we see all kinds of disease. And so the idea is that if there is evil and suffering in the world, then God must not exist. That's the argument. Now, there's a whole thing called apologetics, and apologetics is, is the uh, answering of the questions for God, uh, uh, proving the existence of God. See, the very fact that we ask those questions, what is wrong with the world, what's the world coming to, uh, the very th uh, idea that we are, uh, you know, destined for something more is actually an indicator that there is a God. We call this the moral argument, that when we have this sense that there's, something higher. There's a measurement against which we are measuring morality, right? Because if, if there is no God, then we're just part of the system, right? This idea that there should be something different, that there should be something more, that something's not right. If we're just, uh, you know, dust and dirt, then where does that moral argument come from? Well, this is the uh, proof for God because we do have this compass this morality, this sense that there's something more. And so God does exist because where else would that compass come from? Right, where else would that idea of a standard that's different than we're experiencing? That is a proof that there is a God. It's this moral argument for God. No one denies there's a huge gap between where we are and where we wanna be, but that doesn't need to drive us away from God. How many have heard people say, this drives me away from God, the gap? You know, because I just see the evil and the suffering, and how could God allow that? The problem of evil is a big question, but it's not a, a proof that God doesn't exist. But we, here we see the author of Hebrews saying, we have not yet seen all that God has promised. Anyone driven with someone in the car, usually someone little, and they're always asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? No doesn't mean that we're not going to get there. Right, Because we're not there yet doesn't mean that we're not going to get there. Hebrews 2 verse 8 continues. We have not yet seen all things put under their authority, but what we do see is Jesus. This is the highlight of chapter 2. If you have your highlighter, highlight it. We have not yet seen all things under their authority, but what we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angel's. And because he has suffered death for us, he is now crowned, everyone say crowned, with glory and honor. Yet by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader. Everyone say a perfect leader. Fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. 
That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Everyone say brother. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that we could be, so he could be our merciful and faithful high priest. Everyone say high priest. Because God, uh, before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sin of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. We haven't yet seen all that God has promised. Things aren't perfect in our world, but that doesn't need to make us drift because what we do see is Jesus. So here we have four beautiful pictures of Jesus to hold on to, uh, four aspects of Jesus' relationship with us that when things aren't the way we wish that we would be, we can still hold on to hope because of who Jesus is, because Jesus is greater. First we see a king, a king who got involved. It says that he is crowned with glory and honor. Pastor Tim Keller used to tell a story of, uh, it ran uh, in the New York Times paper about the 1964 murder of a woman named Kitty Genovese. And it happened in Queens, New York, and it was a story that was buried in the papers for a while, just kind of, you know, a, a random story that was forgotten until one of the journalists got digging a little deeper into the story. And according to the police reports, Genevieve was attacked outside her apartment one night. And as she screamed desperately towards the apartment building for help, the lights came on and people began looking out their windows, but the, as a reporter writes, no one came down to assist the dying woman. Initially scared off, the attacker saw that no one was coming to her rescue and actually followed her down the alley and finished what he had started to do and he, and he killed her. During the investigation, it was discovered that 37 people had heard the screams for help, that 37 people had turned on their lights and looked out their windows, but as one witness simply stated, I didn't want to get involved. Jesus is not the type of king who stands at a distance and demands our worship and wants only to be served. Jesus is the king who gets involved. And not when it's cheap, and not when it's convenient, but it's actually at the cost of his own life. Here we're reminded that he tasted death for everyone. Friends, we are not innocent victims in this story. That we deserve the punishment. Uh, Psalm 103 says, though, that he does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal with us harshly with us as we deserve. The Bible is clear that we deserve the punishment of our sin. We deserve what comes from denying God and choosing to do things our own way, our autonomy and our independence from God. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says, physically, but also spiritually, separation from God. But God in his grace does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve because we have a king who stepped out of his glory, that who, who laid down his privileges and in the greatest act of love gave up his life for us. Are you thankful for that this morning? And I love that it says in Psalm 46 that God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. Things aren't the way we wish they would be and the things aren't fully the way God promised yet, but what we do see is Jesus, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Jesus, a king who got involved and now as we think of where we are, where we, we want to be, we can hold on with confidence to our king. Don't drift. Well, Hebrews goes on that we have a perfect leader. That Jesus, though through his suffering, became a perfect leader to bring us into salvation. We use this phrase often that you took one for the team. How many know sometimes as a leader you got to take one for the team? 
You gotta, you gotta take the blow. You gotta take the brunt of the complaint. You gotta be the one who stands on the line of fire for your team. Jesus is the perfect leader. And here we see him taking one for the team, quite literally. You know, there's a lot of other reasons that Jesus is our perfect leader. We'll talk about those in a moment. But building off the fact that he's our king who got involved, we, we look specifically at what he's done for us. And the Hebrew writer says that Jesus took one for the team that he took on our greatest foe. And he took on our greatest fear. It says because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, he became flesh and blood. And it says that only in dying would he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. You know, often in the old days, fights were settled by, by proxies, by, by, by sending a champions. Often armies, instead of getting the whole army involved, would send forth a champion to fight one-on-one. -on -one. We see that in the story of Troy as Hector and Achilles fight each other outside the city walls. More familiar, we see that in the story of David and Goliath. That the champion went out to fight the battles while everyone else stood on the sidelines looking on. Jesus is our champion. He went and he fought for us, and he won for us. He won both over our greatest foe, the devil, and in our greatest fear of death, both of which we had no power to overcome ourselves. But our champion defeated them. As North Americans, we don't like to think much of the devil. We often don't want to think much about death. We do a lot not to think about death, don't we? You know, it's sad to think about missing out on the things that we love. It's sad to think about missing the people that we love. There's this seemingly finality to death. You know, it's hard for a lot of, of us when we see ourselves approaching. We know that there's an expiry date to each of our lives. We don't know when that is. But as we see ourselves aging, that's hard for us sometimes. Uh, I love this quote. Well, I, I don't love it. It's a love and hate. But Ian Fleming famously said this, you start to die the moment you're born. Let that be encouraging to you today. If you don't know what to write in the next birthday card, just write that. You start to die the moment you're born. We're all dying. I hate to tell you that. Some of us, uh, we looked in the mirror this morning, right? And we see ourselves and we try hard to fight it, don't we? We, we get in that, that midlife fitness routine. We start to work out a little more. We, we, we get the Botox injections. What if I came next week with my face, you know, a little tuck here, you know, a little tuck, a little lift. We, we do all that stuff. We, we get a new wardrobe. We buy the toys that make us feel youthful. We try to fight aging as much as we can, don't we? Because we know that it's taking us towards a destination that seems so final. But Jesus, our perfect leader, he doesn't avoid the pain. He steps in front of us, our champion. He takes on our greatest foe in the devil. He takes on this, our greatest fear in dying. And he put both the devil and death away. We can be thankful for Jesus today. Let me let you in a little secret in case you're, you know, I ruined your day thinking about aging and dying. First Corinthians 15 says this, let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. It's from the pages of the Bible. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. You're not dying, you're transforming. You're a transformer. There you go. Learn something at church today. See, here's the thing. If death is defeated, then disease isn't final. Let that get a hold of you. If death is defeated, then disease isn't final. If death is defeated, then disappointment and failure and rejection aren't fatal because there's hope that lies in store for each and every one of us. And we don't have to have the fear of death and of dying because we know that that's a transformation and a transition to something greater that God has for us. This week I sat with two men, one who actually passed away, and I forgot to say that we're going to be praying for Tony Botbill and Jackie. Tony went to be with the Lord this week. And on Saturday coming up at uh, 3 o'clock, we're going to have his celebration of life here. And as I was with the family, we were talking about how there's no fear in dying because we know it's a transition to something greater. We love what we have here. 
We don't want to miss out on those moments that we have with our families and our friends, but we know that there's a graduation to something greater. Jesus accomplished that for us. He is our perfect leader. Uh, Verse 3, the third thing we see in verse 11 is that Jesus isn't just a perfect leader. He's not just uh, the king who gets involved. We, We see a brother who's not ashamed of us. Think about that for a moment. This is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Who has a family member that you were at least a little embarrassed by? Right? Or maybe even just, not all the time, but just for a moment. Right? As a dad, I feel like it's a fundamental part of my duty to embarrass my kids. It keeps them humble. Right? When their friends come over, I need to ask them how their rash is in front of their friends so that they feel that humility. This is my job, to embarrass. They're going to be embarrassed of me anyways, right? They, they're like, drop me off a block from school so that no one sees that I'm with you, right? We, we all have that, right? So they're going to be embarrassed by me anyways, and I just might as well embrace it all, all together. Right? How many had a younger sibling who does the weirdest thing? Or maybe you have the weird uncle. Maybe you have a family member without a filter who just says crazy things all the time. Right? We all have family members that we've been embarrassed by. We've all had family members who hurt us, who've let us down, who's disappointed us. Listen to what Jesus says. In the resurrection moment, having Easter's over, he's risen from the grave, and it says that he meets with the women in the garden. This is what he says to the disciples who have just betrayed him in his moment of darkest need. The ones who have denied knowing him. Listen to what he says. Go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Even in this moment of deepest betrayal, Jesus looks at us and he calls us his brothers, calls us his sisters. Even when we've embarrassed him, disappointed him, we've failed him, Jesus as a brother is not ashamed of us. He calls us his own. Lastly, we see in this text that we have a high priest who can help. You know, at first glance, this might be hard to understand. Couldn't have Jesus helped us without having to become human? You know, it's not like God had to learn something by being tempted or, or by suffering. It's not for his sake that he had to become flesh in order to help us. God is omniscient. He, he knows all things. He, he didn't need to experience temptation. He didn't need to experience suffering. He didn't need to walk a mile in our shoes to understand us better, but we needed him to. We needed him to. We needed to know that when we pray, that we pray to a God who's felt everything that we feel. We need to know that God knows what it's like. We see through scriptures that Jesus was tempted. Tempted with sin, tempted to take the shortcut, tempted not to follow on that path of long obedience. We see that Jesus was tired. We saw that he has sadness, that he was betrayed. How did Jesus deal with betrayal? How did he deal with disappointment? Jesus knows what it's like to be like us. To be honest, he knew what it was like to be single in his 30s. Jesus gets us. Right? The Bible says he's going to weddings when everyone else would have been married a long time ago. He knows what it's like to have kids walk out on you. He tells the story of the prodigal son. Who is Jesus in that story? He's the father who knows what it's like to have your children walk away from you. Jesus knows what you're going through. And he understands. Sometimes just knowing that God knows is enough. I don't know everything you're going through here today, but what I do know is that Jesus is everything you need him to be. He's everything you need him to be. He's a king who got involved. He's the perfect leader who's invested. He's a brother who's not ashamed of you. He's a priest who can help. He's everything you need him to be if you'll let him. If you'll let him. If you'll put him in that place in your life. This morning, I don't know what gaps you're seeing between where you are and where you want to be. Where you are and what you feel God's promised in his word. But when we see the gap and we don't yet see the promises of God fulfilled, what we do see is Jesus. Keep our eyes on Jesus and don't drift.